In they come. Evening all. Evening, folks. Hi. <laughs> so he was awake and watching. Yeah. Uh, Radio. We'll. Uh... Evening all, Steve. Hi, Fozzie. How you doing? That's what we like. Uh, good. We'll just give it. Uh, just give it one. Uh, one more minute, just for. Uh... Uh, for a couple more, or we could unmute Dave Harvey and see what he's playing. <laughs> <laughs> that made him laugh. <laughs> it's only doing wheels on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It's uh, it's great to see people. I must say. Uh, I must say. Um, okay. It's uh, I haven't my as I said my second screen's down, Grant. So I haven't got my real estate sorted out. Are we. Uh, Yep, we're doing good. I think we're pretty much there. We're up to uh, 30 odd, 35, 36. Very good. Good to see Hayden come in. I've remembered to press record. It's always Excellent. a good start. <laughs> <laughs> right. In that case, then we will uh, we will kick off uh, kick off proceedings. Uh, so we're going to see how um, uh, how this goes. So a little bit different, uh, uh, midweek one. Uh, and I uh, appreciate there's been some comments around. Oh, well, the dogs even come to have a look. Um, there's been some comments around possibly changing dates, so we'll uh, uh, we'll we'll think about that. We know it clashes with um, the BAA one in in particular, so uh, apologies, but we've we'd sort of got the date set. So um, uh, hopefully the BAA will be recording their sessions so that uh, that people can catch up with that. Um, so uh, so this evening uh, we're delighted. We've got uh, two of our mod team that uh, we've. Um, managed to convince to come and uh, come and give you lovely people to talk. Uh, so first up is a Lunator, a proper name is Ian, uh, and Ian's passion is with double stars. So he's going to take us through um, uh, through his observations and how to see some of these double stars and then some uh, some targets to go for. Uh, and then we've got Mark, Mark of Beaufort, and uh, he's going to take us through his observing uh, processes and how he gets ready for a night's observing uh, and some tips and tricks to uh, to help us um, uh, in that regard. So I think uh, in that case uh, I will hand uh, straight over to Ian and he will talk to us about double stars. Thank you very much. I'll share the screen first and then hopefully you'll be able to see the presentation. There we go. Can everyone see that okay? Thumbs up? Okay, okay. so it's a very brief overview of double stars. The idea is that um, I know that a lot of you guys uh, do imaging and I'm always massively impressed with the quality of the images of galaxies and nebula I see. This is something hopefully that if your telescope and imaging rig is happily wearing away, you can break out and have a little look at the night sky and just a few targets you to enjoy whilst you collect those, the, the data for those fantastic images. So I thought I'd start with why I observe double stars. Now, actually the reason I started doing it was I used to observe from London, which is one of those things is that when you observe from London, it's not so much of what you like to observe, it's what can you see? And I sort of came across double stars uh, because generally they're relatively easy to find. They're less affected by the conditions, even if it's a bit, mucky out there you can still see something and they're quite nice you've got you know, some nice colors there um, in terms of investigating them it's quite hands-on can be quite practical and I quite enjoy working with some professionals I've got papers and been mentioned I actually discovered it I've forgotten all about it I got mentioned in the astronomical journey back, journal back in 2008 I managed to dig out a copy of it I was quite surprised I completely forgot about it and because of their variety you have wide you have tight pairs you have ones with lovely colour contrast, you have pairs which are already matching, and you have pairs which are already even, very uneven. And it's actually quite interesting to, particularly uneven pairs, to see if you can split them on any given night, because some nights you can split them, other nights you don't even get close. And it's just one of those things you never quite know how it's going to pan out on the night. So what I've done is I've just picked basically six relatively well-known pairs. Well, there's, uh, there's one extra one in there, which is a bit trickier. Um, but probably some people know the doubles and some people may not. But if you're kind of getting into double star observing as a starting point, these aren't bad ones to actually get cracking with because they will actually 
be suitable for telescopes or even binoculars. So even if you've got one telescope which you're imaging with and you have a set of binoculars, you can actually still do some observing if you want to. So the one I'm going to start with is Polaris, then I'll go on to a very famous uh, Mizar and Alcor, then on to um, Isar, Mubutis, Cor, Caroli, Alpha Hercules, and then one which doesn't have a name, which is Struve 2097. Okay, so what I've done is I've done a little map. Now, obviously, most people should know where Polaris is, the North Star. If you are an imager and you don't know, look where your mount is pointed, because generally that will be in the right direction. But if you, if you do need a hand, basically, you can look at the brightest two stars uh, on the plough, and it points pretty much straight at Polaris. So it's very easy to find, look north. Um, it is actually quite a wide pair. The, in the brackets here, you can see it's, it's got the information I drew from the Washington Double Star um, database, and it's about 18 arc seconds. So that's actually quite wide, but it's also quite uneven in its brightness. You have a magnitude two star and a magnitude nine. So it's quite a big difference, but because they're 18 arc seconds apart, you can actually split them with what I call a fairly moderate magnification. So even if you've got quite a small scope, you know, I use 70, 80 mils, if you're doing a, a 70 to 100 magnification, you should be able to see them quite easily. And they do show quite a nice color because Polaris is kind of a white, creamy white, uh, and the secondary is faint and looks a little bit blue. It's quite common for the fainter stars. It's strange when it gets to below magnitude nine, they start going blue before they go gray and lose all color completely. Um, in terms of a little bit of history, uh, it was first included by Struve, um, if you, you look at the date where it says Epoch, it says 1781, which probably means it was first observed by William Herschel, but actually wasn't given an official label until Struve came out of his catalogue probably about 20, 30 or plus years later. Um, it's a, also, Polaris is a slightly variable because it's a seafood variable. I've said here it's one of the closest, I think decided now it probably is the closest seafood variable to the Earth, and obviously the, they reckon it's about 400-ish, 430 light years away. And why it's quite so important is because obviously CV variables are one of the first stepping stones or rungs on the ladder they use to measure stellar distances. So once you've gone past parallax, you then into the world of the CV variables to get to the near galaxies, etc. So Polaris being one of those is actually quite an important start because it's quite close and variable. We use it as a standard candle to try and work out where the next bit of the distance into space we can go to. And at the bottom here, we have the various different labels that they have. As you well know, there's numerous different catalogues. And if you do have a handset um, on your uh, EQ6 or whatever, you may be able to type some of these in and it will take you to the to Polaris. So you don't necessarily need to know the coordinates, you can put those in. So I have included them because I appreciate this is being recorded so you can always look at this and just take the information off the slide. Okay, moving on. So we started Polaris. So I'll just show you, this is a photograph I took of Polaris probably 10, 15 years ago, something like that. I don't know exactly. Um, but as you can see, that gives you an indication of the actual difference in magnitude between Polaris and its companion. So the next uh, pair I'm looking at is a very famous pair. It's Mars and Alcor. Now, I've also just found it. You can pretty much go straight down from Polaris. It's very famous because it's at the other end of the plough. Um, it's on kind of at the handle or the elbow, whichever you want to call it. Um, now, it's very easy spotted. It is a the it is a wide naked eye pair. Um, believe it or not, it was used by the Arabs as an eye test. Now, when I was young, I'm thinking, why the heck would it be an eye test? But probably when you turn about 60 to 70, then probably you might it might turn out to be quite a good eye test. I have no idea. I haven't got quite that far yet, even though I've now now wear glasses. Um, in my experience, it it can be viewed naked eye or through binoculars. You know, it's a nice 10 by 50 or even a 50 by 80 will give a very nice view or even a small telescope with a very low level of magnification. You'll get a very nice pair of, of white stars. Um, now, Visor itself is a binary. Obviously, it's much closer. If you look at the top here, it says it's roughly about 14 arc seconds. So it's a little bit closer than Polaris, 
but also it's a, a lot closer in terms of magnitude. You've got one which is two, one which is four. So there's a, there's a little difference, but it's actually you know, quite similar in magnitude in that respect. And when you look through a telescope and you can see all three stars, it's quite, quite a nice sight. Um, and to actually split that pair at times 50 magnification, we'll get a very nice framing of having Mizar and its companion and Altar in, in the same field of view. So you'll actually get a nice good wide triple in that respect. Um, and strangely enough, it's actually a very, very unique star in terms of it was the first noted to be a telescopic visual double by uh, Jean Baptiste, and that was back in 1650. So it's pretty early on in the after the invention of the telescope. Um, he pretty much, I guess, he pointed it because he could see there were two stars there. He thought, I'll have a look, and he saw that there was a companion. And strange enough, it was the first one to be photographed by G. B. Bond, and that was in 1857. And then it was also the first pair, actually Mars was the first pair to be a, discovered to be a spectroscopic binary by E.C. Pickering in 1889. So basically, it seems to be where astronomers go to discover to do things for the first time. So, yeah, I don't quite know how it worked that way, but it's quite a curious little thing. Now, in terms of distances, they are quite close. Um, Mars is only 86 light years away, out there are 82. Um, and they are considered, they're not, they're not in orbit of each other, but they are considered part of the kind of Ursa Major moving stream. So they are thought to come from the original open cluster, which over time has been stripped and stretched and all that sort of stuff. And there's quite a few bright stars around, which are considered part of the same group of stars. So they are linked, but they just don't happen to be gravitationally bound. And, and, and again, underneath, I have put all the various labels that we astronomers have managed to give them over the years. So if you want to pop those into your star atlases or into your handsets, then hopefully it will take you there. Although, to be honest, they're so obvious that you can, if you have a dog, you'll be able to swing them, see them, swing them around and see them straight away very, very easily. Okay, and here's another, another photograph I took of them. I don't actually put any dates on it, did I? Um, oh, yeah, 2007, there we go. Uh, it's very similar, you've got Mizar and its companion up on the top left there, you have Alcor bottom right, and there is a, another star there, which I believe might well be linked to them, but it, it's never been proven one, other, one way or the other, as far as I'm aware. Um, but that's pretty much what you would see at low power through uh, a telescope. Okay, and then we're going to drop down. So we've gone through from Polaris through to Mizar and and we keep going down, um, not quite in a straight line, but nearly in a straight line. And we come to uh, Canis and Natchez, and we look at the alpha there, which is called currently. Now, this star has an interesting little bit of history around it. It's called Charles's Heart after Charles I. And it was claimed, although I don't think it actually did happen, that in 1660, it shone extra brightly uh, on the restoration of Charles II. Now, you know, it, 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 these things enter um, folklore. I don't think it's true, but funnily enough, it is a variable. It has a, it, it's, it's considered a, bit, a very rare type of star because it has very strong variable magnetic fields. Unfortunately, the variation is too small to be observed visually, but the professional astronomers have seen that it actually does vary in brightness and it, it, it is one of those stars they like to investigate. Now most people see them as white but this is one of those curious ones where people have put yellow and orange various things. Now it might be because they're looking through um, you know, a two element refractor or something like that to get a little bit of colour but it's one of those curious ones where people do see it with different colours. So just because someone says oh it's a white pair of stars Actually, to you, if you look at it, it may not have, it may have a nice little cream or yellow colour to it or something like that. Now, I've looked at it in my observations. It's relatively simple split at 50 times 50 magnification. But because it's roughly 20 arc seconds apart, you may, with decent binoculars, you might be able to get a hint of the secondary through binoculars. I don't know. If you do use binoculars, I'll be very interested, you can put it on the forum and say, yeah, I got it all, no, I didn't get close, because it'd be quite interesting to see actually whether you can see it or not. I don't know, actually, I've never actually tried, but I, will, I may be trying with 15 by 80s at some point later in the year. Now, in terms of distances, it is actually one of the nearest stars, but it's only 120 light years away, like mine was only 
and 86. So they, they are quite local. I know, I mean, 120 is a long way away, but in terms of the Galaxy, that's, it's, it's relatively local. Uh, and again, at the bottom, I've put a load of the labels that we have given it over the years. So you'll be able to potentially put it into your system and find out where it is, etc. But it should be relatively easy to spot underneath the kind of the handle of the plow. And here's again a pick I took it back in 2007. Um, it, it's a very simple level in that respect. It's not too difficult to, to split. Now, if you leave Cork Alley and you kind of head south and eastwards, um, you end up in Booties to Herdsman and you end up at a star which is very famous in, amongst double star observers, and that's Isar. Now, as you can see, it is just above Arcturus, so it should be relatively easy to spot. So it is always seen as a showpiece double. Now, I see it as yellow and blue. A lot of people see it as yellow and blue, but funny enough, quite a few people also see the primary as orange. So I'm not saying which one's right. It's just different people see it with different, different colors. But whatever color you see, it is a very lovely color contrast pair, which does reward spending a bit of time looking at it. It's about 210 light years away, so it's a little bit further than we can look at some of the other ones. Um, it, the name that it's given, Isart, means girdle or loincloth, because it's part of Hootie's the birds. And I said, well, it's quite handy. If you're herding stuff, I guess you probably, a loincloth is quite handy to make sure things stay where they need to stay and, and you keep your decency intact, etc. cetera. Um, the alternative name is Pulcherima, which is Latin. I think it was Struve who gave this name, although I'm not 100% sure. But basically means most beautiful, which um, to your average person like myself, that states in the obvious. Uh, but it is, it, it's a nice alternative name. Now, as I've already said, it is just up and left of Arcturus, which is the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere, just. Uh, and so it should be relatively easy to track down. Now, although it's quite bright, it's relatively close at only 2.9 arc seconds and you will need at least 100 to kind of get a clean split you might be able to get away with slightly less but it's one of those things is the primary is so bright that you need a certain magnification just to pull them apart a little bit to give the secondary good chance to come out you, you you'll get a hint of it below 100 but yet you want to see a nice pair of stars it's neatly separated about 100 we should do it but Diana, that's not too too hard work but I would definitely recommend it. If, if you only have time to look at one, then I would definitely recommend this one because it, it is a very beautiful pair that very much rewards uh, observing. And again, as I said at the bottom, we, we have all the labels that we've given these pair over the years, etc. And here's a photograph. Actually, this is quite good to show you exactly how to, I took this again back in 2007. And as you can see, even photographically, um, and this is 133. The primary was almost trying to overwhelm the secondary uh, on my system, and it, it, that's not a million miles away what it looks like um, through a scope. Now, if you have a Newtonian and your scope isn't very well collimated, then this pair will probably give you a bit of trouble, but uh, hopefully, if you've got it collimated, it will be too hard to separate. Okay, so we're now going to leave um, Kaiser and we're going to kind of head sort of north and eastwards to a pair which probably a lot of people haven't really heard of or paid that much attention to. And they're called Mubutis. Now, I presume you pronounce the name here calling al Kolorops or something like that. Being Arabic, I'm not Arabic, so I'm not 100% sure exactly how it's pronounced. Um, but basically it means club, which I presume if you're a herdsman, you carry a club in case the average bear or lion tries to take and eat whatever you're herding. Um, they are quite a close pair, 120 light years away. Now, Mu1 and Mu2 are easily splitting split, split binoculars. As you can see, they're about 109, 110 arc seconds separate, so you can see them quite easily through binoculars. The reason you need binoculars rather than naked eyes, the secondary is magnitude 7, so unless you're an exceptionally dark sky, you probably haven't got a chance of seeing it. Um, but if you then look at the fainter 7th magnitude pair, you'll find out that that actually is another pair. And for that one, you're going to need a, a fair
fairly high motivation. I've said 180, you might get away with slightly less depending on the conditions. Um, but it's, if you do use about 180, that should definitely work for you. Uh, and it is actually a gravitationally bound pair. All the other ones I've shown you so far, they there are definitely some maybe links and gravitationally some possibly not. Mutu definitely is, as they've worked out, has an orbit of around 260 years. I don't know what the grade of the orbit is. They do from one to five, whereas one is they've got it absolutely nailed down and five is, is a complete guess. It's probably a two or a three, but they reckon it's about 260 years. So you probably, over a number of years, if you pay very close attention to it, you might see them move ever so slightly. They're not going to change massively, but you probably can see from the, the second line down, they originally were at a position angle of 357 to almost due north, and it's now moved four. So it's only seven degrees, but it's still seven degrees, and also it's separate, it's widened out from one and a half to 2.2. .2. So there's definitely some changes going on there. So if you want a very long-term project, then something like this is following it will show you some, some movement over the years. Uh, and again, I've put some information there in terms of move one, move two's information in terms of the actual um, labels that we've given them over the years. And here's a photo again, I took in 2007, I'm busy in 2007. And you can see you've got the brighter move one further down the picture, and then you've got the two fainter ones further up, which are fairly similar in, in magnitude. And as you said, this took 192 to get the, the image. So, you know, something around 180, which would work visually. And now we're going to scoot across. We're going to go through Corona Borealis because there's some lovely doubles in there, but I decided that I wasn't going to use any from there. And go down to one of my favourite doubles, which is all the way over down the bottom of Hercules, and that's our Hercules. Now it's also known as Rasalgethi, which stands for the Neela's head, because I understand it. Hercules is upside down as we look at it. Um, so the Alpha, which is the bottom, is where his head is. Now it's an interesting star in its own right. Again, it's a red giant over 400 times the diameter of the Sun. So. We, that makes it one of the largest stars known. Not the largest, but definitely one of the largest. It's erratically variable, so if you like a little bit of variable stars, it's worth having a look, but there's no pattern to it from what I understand. But it varies between magnitude three and four, so that's you know quite a significant change, so you should spot whether it's going up or down. Um, the companion is thought to orbit every 3,600 years, but I would hazard a guess that's the best guess. Uh, and obviously, in, on a human, time scales, we ain't going to see a change an awful lot over its orbit. It's going to move very, very slowly. But the reason I included it is it's one of the few stars, the companion is one of the few stars that can appear green. Now, I haven't really seen it as green. I've seen it sort of bluey green, but some people have definitely seen it as green. You don't get green stars in reality. If they were green, we see them as white. Uh, but just because the main star is M5, which means it means it's a very, very, very red star. When you put them quite close together, your brain does something weird with your eyesight and can make the companion look green. So if you do want to have a look at a green star, that is one of your best bets to see something like that. And again, down the bottom, I've put a little list of all the labels that we've given it so you can use them to try and track down the object. Uh, and here's a little photograph I took it. This one actually was 2006. Um, and again, it's a nice, relatively wide pair, so it, it, it should be easy to split with moderate magnification. Okay, and now we're moving on to the last one. Now, this one's the one which is a little bit different. So you have to leave Alpha Hercules and you're barreling back north, northwest, almost getting to M13, but not quite. Because when you get quite close to it, it is there, just underneath it. So if you're having a look at M13 anyway, uh, or you're imaging M13, then by all means pop down and have a look at this double. It doesn't have a name uh, in the catalogs because it's relatively um, faint because of both nine magnitude. Um, it will take relatively high, moderate high magnification to split, so 180 to 200. Um, both stars are white, so there's, there's no fancy colour there, etc. at all. But the way to find it is basically one degree southeast of M13. 
it's 410 light years away, so it's one of the more distant ones that we've discussed today. Although it's relatively bright because it's about three to four times the luminosity of the sun, so it, it's pretty pretty big. Although it's being a G5, I would hazard a guess that it's probably just coming off the main sequence and is turning into a giant, so that, that's why it has bright, it is quite luminous. But it certainly is if, if you want a pair, which if you're getting your eye in and you want to pair, which is not impossible to do, but a little bit challenging, is an ideal pair because you should be able to see in pretty much any size telescope over 70, 80 mils, um, but it will take a little bit of work to, to split if you're doing it for the first time. Okay, so that those are all the ones that I'd recommend for the next few weeks. They're all well positioned overnight. I appreciate this time of year, there isn't an awful lot of darkness, but if you're up at one o'clock in the morning, you probably have a shout and seeing all of them in one night if you wanted to. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have from that little snapshot. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so you are an imager, really. So you do take those, uh, <laughs> those yes, pictures. Absolutely. Um, OK, we're going to try something a little uh, a little different tonight. Normally uh, on the Sunday sessions, we um, uh, Sorry, wrong picture was that, Ian, I thought there. Um, uh, normally on the Sunday sessions, we uh, <laughs> uh, we ask the questions, but uh, we are going to try and hand over to uh, to you guys. So, um, uh, Ron, I'm not sure that's a question, the fact you've had a downpour down in Carlisle, mate, but uh, I hope you're inside and you're, and you're dry, but, uh, but there you go. Uh, so, uh, Husey, I'm going to come to you first, and if I can figure out how to do this. Where's it gone? Oh. Yeah. Oh, I never do live things, that's what they say. So I'm going to ask, click on that button. Should, Husey, should I ask you to unmute? Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. There you go. Um, Ian, thanks for the presentation. Really interesting. Um, Double Stars is something I'll be looking forward to getting involved in. Uh, I was just interested in the labels across the top of the, the, the tables that are in each star's chart. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them I could guess, but would you be able, just be able to go through those with us, please? Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, I'll try I'll, I'll to do you want to try and open the presentation up again and talk it through or yeah go for it go for it okay so I'll just pull that one up there uh, hopefully that will be there we go so um, yeah so the first Ian, you need to do share screen again sorry share screen. oh sorry uh, okay no problem share screen is that okay now everyone see that yeah fantastic okay so the column on the left is the actual coordinates that they have in the washington double star so if you put those coordinates into your handset it should take you to where that star is based on the information there so for in terms of mars and isle core it's 13, 23.9, and then plus 54, 56. So they're, they're so close together that you can put the same coordinates in and it will pick up both stars. The second column is the actual discoverer's label. So every double star that's discovered is given the name of that discoverer. I have three to my name, so which puts me at near the bottom of the list of discoverers, but I have three. Um, the epoch is the year when the particular particular observations that they've got on here were taken so the first measures of Mars were taken in 1755 and then um alcohol in 1831 the last measure they have on their system and now admittedly this is from 2016 in terms of the washington double star catalog was in 2015 and 2013 the OBS is the number of observations people have made, so the number of measures they've actually made. So for the close pair of MISAR, there's been 77 measures that have been accepted by the professionals in Washington, and for the outdoor, it's only been 12. The theta is the position angle. So basically, if you drew a circle from due north, and you have the primary in the middle, and then you work your way around to where the secondary is, so in terms of um, Mars art, in terms of the A and B, when it was first measured, it was 143, which is below east, but not quite south. 
and that was taken in 1755 and in 2015 it moved to 153 so it's getting a bit nearer to being south and so over those years it moved 10 degrees and the row is a distance in arc seconds so when it was measured in 1755 it was 13.9 arc seconds and in 2015 it was 14.4 now what that says to me is it's possibly widened a bit but there isn't a massive difference there so it doesn't look like they're moving a huge amount at the moment and then the p magnitude is the magnitude of the primary star and the s magnitude is the primary of the secondary and the, the spectral one is a spectral type so as you can see it's an a1v so it's an a class star quite a bright one because it's a1 it's a v so it's main sequence and then the PSRS is the random stuff they put in terms of various um, metallic lines that they have in star, where they've got a particular type of um, absorption or emission line or something like that. I don't know all the fine detail on that, but it just means that it's not a bog standard A1B star. They've definitely got additional um, information on what the spectrum is like, etc. So hopefully that covers all the various columns there. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, uh, well, I think we've got a collection of, uh, of experts because <laughs> that's really been the only question. Nobody has got a question for Ian on... Can I ask uh, a question? Yeah, go for it. Ian, how do you find one from scratch? Do you, do you pick a <laughs> random bit of the sky and have a look? How, how does it actually uh, work? Yeah, the, well, the, the first two, I was um, looking at a neglected double called Schiller 1. Uh, and I looked... Um, and the reason I got mentioned in the Astronomical Journal was that the guys in Washington were using their advanced camera survey on their 28-inch refractor to basically image bits of the sky, and this was on their list. Um, but before they got there, I happened to look at it with the 18-inch Newtonian on the EQ5, um, which only goes to show you don't have a very big expensive telescope to spot things. And uh, I, I found the, the object, but then discovered that what the Schiller had written, he'd written a um, the coordinates for one pair, but there was another pair very nearby, which had the um, different coordinates, but it had the correct um, position angle and separation. So I thought this would make sense because the one the star at the coordinates had the wrong position angle, position angle and separation. So I basically made contact with the professional and said oh by the way I've been looking at this one but I found another pair they don't they seem to be seen as the same pair but the information is either the coordinates are wrong or the um, the data is wrong and it looks like we've got two pairs not one pair so the guys at Washington checked that and said yes you're right there's two pairs not one pair so they gave Mr Schiller one pair and gave me the other pair uh, and that just happened in the same bit of sky, there was another pair quite close by that I kind of said, well, okay, they, they could be a, a pair as well. And I observed, and I, I noted those and they got accepted. And my third pair, that's been, I think they say that's now based on Gaia, they think it's an optical pair, but I was on holiday uh, and had my little um, 120 mil uh, refractor. And I was just looking through some screw doubles and there was a relatively wide but bright pair, about a degree, away from a Struve double in uh, a Keeler and so I just I popped it in there and I said oh yeah, yeah we'll have a look at it so it, it got accepted but I think it's now classified as an optical double so it, over time they will move further apart or move further together but they won't have an orbit around each other etc. So basically you just looking at the sky and you find stuff. Now whether that still can happen now with Gaia hoovering everything up I don't know but certainly that's how I did it. I would have thought there's probably still scope for that sort of stuff, especially uh, and because I, I think uh, you've mentioned before there's a sort of there's a neglected uh, or a catalogue of neglected doubles, isn't there? Uh, yes, they, I mean they've got a lot of them viewed now because back in 2006, 2007, it was they were they were I think it was well over a, two or three thousand were totally neglected. They've got a lot of those checked out now. It became fashionable for a while, um, <laughs> but they're now. They look at another range. A lot of people have got doubles assigned to them by doing data mining projects. They go on to the various surveys that have been done and find stars with very similar magnitudes and very similar um, proper motions. 
across okay. the sky. Okay. And by doing that, they can then claim that they're, they're linked. And so a lot of people are doing that, but I've never felt inspired to do that. I tend to like my discoveries to be found whilst looking through a telescope, not doing data mining. The old traditionalist you. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, uh, there's one come in from Chris Lee. So, Chris, I'm going to click this button and it should ask you to uh, unmute yourself. That's right. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can, yes. Uh, no, the question was, I've got a, um, an 18-inch um, Schmidt uh, Cassegrain and mm. I look at the double stars and I very rarely see the colour that is ascribed to them. I mean, I see them as off whites and creamy whites or, or whites, apart from the really obvious biggies like Alberio and so on, where there's clearly mm. the colour. Uh, and others uh, people have said to me, ah, oh, yeah, that's because you're using a, an SCT. You should really use an APO. If you use a, a refractor, you'll see the colours much more clearly and distinctly. I don't have one. Is that true? Or should SCTs also have very clear colour? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I wouldn't call an APO being particularly a sort of, in my experience, if you want really colourful doubles, get an ACRO. Because they can, in my little ST120 that I used to have, you used to get some vivid colours through that. But that was not the colour of the star. That was due to the what happens with the light path and the fact that the two elements at the front aren't quite right in managing to get all the colours of the light to properly align. It's a classic big purple haze around the moon thing. It's the same thing. You can get some very vivid purples and um, sort of blues and oranges, etc. But actually, that isn't. Um, I, I have um, I have an OMC 250, which has a very small lens in it. Um, but in my experience, colours for doubles are relatively subtle anyway, the true colours. Mm -hmm. I mean, something like um, Alpha Hercules, that and Isar, they are the ones which do show proper colour. But once you're getting down to eighth, ninth magnitude, any colour you're going to see is going to be quite subtle. Mm -hmm. You know, quite often, I mean, I've got my... This is an observing thing from 2014, 2015, or whatever. And I'm pretty sure if I looked at it, um, it will probably say creamy white or off white or yep. a subtle tint of blue and things like that. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. I don't think APOs will be particularly good at making the doubles more colourful than your SCT. Uh, I mean, generally, an 18-inch SCT will probably have a better chance of drawing colour out of a fainter pair than an APO, purely because you've got more photons hitting your eye. Mm -hmm. that will allow your cones to be stimulated versus a relatively small APO. You get a great view through the APO, don't get me wrong, you're absolutely superb. But the colour probably will be less vivid because you've got less photons to stimulate the cones in your eye. I mean, I could certainly do with learning a few more words other than off-white, creamy white, <laughs> yes, vaguely <laughs> white. <laughs> it's like going into a paint store, isn't it? Uh, it's, uh, yeah. How many shades Thanks. of white can there be? Uh, great question. Thanks, uh, Thanks, Chris. Um, okay, Ian, thanks very much indeed. That was uh, uh, really interesting. Hopefully it's inspired a few people to... Um, uh, to go off and uh, uh, observe some of these doubles. So we are now going to um, hand over to Mark at Beaufort. And Mark, uh, as I said before, is going to take us through uh, some of his processes, tips and tricks um, when he's planning his observing sessions. Uh, so I think, Ian, if you stop sharing yep. your screen and then Mark can take over. Okay. Okay, it's working. Uh, Excellent. What I, what I wanted to do was to not only explain how I actually go about an evening's observing, but also show my location and some of the things that I do to help me observe, including um, light pollution. So what I'm going to show, and this has got nothing to do with Gardening's World, this is my garden at the edge of Hereford. And as you can see, this is my Western Horizon. Um, and I do all my observing. This is about 30, 35 meters long, this garden. And that is my little six inch 
um, scope which I was using for solar observing that particular day. So this is the garden that I work from. And the reason I'm showing that is that the house, um, obviously, usually I, the lights are turned off. But if uh, the lights do get turned on or when my neighbours get turned on, it will obviously affect things. So there's my blackout blinds. These are, are based upon a, a rotary line which goes right across the garden. And they, the blackout blinds are in fact black ground sheets that I bought from B&M stores. And uh, they clip onto the, the line and it virtually covers the whole area at the bottom of the garden and behind it, because there's no lights either to the west and you'll see in a moment to the south, I sit in a totally dark area. And so to keep Pam happy when I finish observing, it gets tucked away. So you can't actually see it at all. Um, so if you have a problem with light pollution or if you want to try and black out your garden, a visit to B&M stores with a washing line can in fact make life a bit easier. Uh, what I wanted to show, this is uh, the main telescope that I use for my deep sky um, observing. And I wanted to show a few things on it um, because if you've got a large Dobsonian, um, they're quite heavy. I think this Dobsonian weighs about, with its base, about 45 kilos. So when you get to my age, trying to lift 45 kilos is quite a lot. So these handles are from a company called WDS in Leeds. And, and that one there as well. The actual OTA is kept separate in the garage. And in fact, the base is kept in the shed that I was shown on the previous picture. And I've actually installed handles on there as well. So what I do, I just carry this out to the area at the bottom of the garden and then I can literally carry this 20 plus kilo scope very easily down the garden holding one there and holding this handle there and then to lift it onto the mount I've got those two quite decent sized handles and it makes life very very easy. Um, I've also installed as you might be able to see uh, lockable wheels from screw fix which helps me move the scope if I need to. Uh, and in addition, I've actually installed these plastic trays, courtesy of an old ridge refrigerator. And on there, the front, I carry uh, a 12 volt hairdryer, just in case I need to uh, blow on the filters or whatever else. Um, but I've also got in there, you might just better see it, some red glasses. So if, for example, I needed to leave the scope and come indoors for a short while, I actually put those red glasses on to try and conserve my uh, light um, density. Uh, so as far as observing is concerned, you can actually say on the top, I have a, a dual mount there. That is a red dot finder for going on to the particular object that I want to see or roughly to see before star hopping. And this is an 80 mil Altair right angled correct image finder scope, which where you start looking for more fainter deep sky objects, having an 80 mil finder scope makes a lot of difference in my opinion. So this is uh, um, my usual eyepieces, which I carry onto a table um, by the side of my, my scope. Um, obviously you can see what they are, they're two inches, most of them are 100 degree eyepieces. And these are all my filters, which I actually mark what they actually are in big letters so I can actually easily uh, find them if I want to start looking at different objects using um, a UHC or a, a oxygen three or a hydrogen beta. Um, I've also included a picture not of the, the actual star atlas but this large plastic box because if any of you have been out in the winter when there starts to be humidity and a lot of dew about, what you don't want to do is to have your uh, lovely expensive star atlas ruined by dew. So normally I actually keep this in the plastic box, but then I move it to a music stand. So normally, this is my southern horizon by the way, so you can see the sort of view I have. Uh, usually the, the Dobsonian is there and this is right by the side of it. Uh, so when I'm starting to star hop, I can use um, eyepiece 
then I go on to the, the star atlas um, for allowing me to kind of star hop between different objects I want to see. Having it on a, on a music stand is so much easier than having it on a table standing by the telescope and then having to walk back try and memorize what i was just looking at and then going back to the telescope this is side by side so if you have never tried that if you can get hold of a music stand i would recommend it now in terms of how i start an observing session as you all know every single object in the night sky has a right ascension and declination and obviously um, depending on the RA of a particular object, there are certain times of the year when it's quite easy or better to actually view those particular objects. So as we're now in mid-June, roughly, you can see we should be somewhere around about 16 hours right ascension. Now, if you go on to the Messier list, you'll now see these are all the stars virtually visible in the northern hemisphere and in fact some coming down quite low down to about uh, minus 30 deck or lower and if I go across you can actually see 16 hours right ascension and if I go up as Ian was showing he was showing some of the stars in Hercules and, and whatever and Butez you can see these are the stars and the constellations that you can actually see at 16 hours so if I was trying to observe tonight and I'll show you something at the moment you can almost guarantee to get the best view of these because they're obviously higher when they, they when they transit uh, between this area here you're going to get better views of some of these objects especially some of the objects in Scorpius or in Sagittarius I took absolutely ages to finish the Messier objects and the two this caused me the biggest problems were these two globulars in Sagittarius, M17, M69, I think it is. It took me for ages to actually find them because they were kind of um, difficult to see because of the looking through dense atmosphere. But in terms of producing your program, then obviously it's useful in my view to try and stick to objects in the right ascension on the particular date that you're using. So you can see the objects that you can actually see. Um, I know people will go across and try and view others, but I try to get structured to my observing program um, and choose the objects that I actually want to see. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Now, if you've got, which I believe is one of the better little um, star atlases, this is the Sky and Telescope Pocket Atlas. And at the back is a key chart. And again, it shows you the errors across the top. And, and you can now see, we're, we're roughly about here again. So we're now still brain about Scorpius and Libra and, 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 and Hercules. So if you wanted to see M13 or M92 or you want to see M57 here, these are starting to be the best times to see it. If you're lucky enough to say, if we ever do this again, to say, well, I actually want to see some of the objects a bit lower down. I've always fancied to see Amiga Centauri in Centaurus, then obviously you you can judge roughly by its right ascension. It's around about, I'm not sure, 13 to 14 hours. You can see that sometime around about April time is a good time to go gallivanting off to the Canary Islands to see Amiga Centauri if you actually want to. I'm quite fortunate because I have a son who lives uh, about 20 miles outside of San Francisco, and that's about minus. Um, 30 deck it's 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 uh, sorry it's it's latitudes 30 degrees sorry um, and whenever I go into seaport in California I tend to be a guest of um, a star a group out there called Tri-Valley Astronomers and they have their telescope on top of a mountain top very close to the Lick Observatory and you've all heard of the Lick Observatory in California um, and I was invited out there last year um, and was invited to their site. And they gave me use of their 18 inch um, uh, Newtonian. And I can tell you, if you look at Amiga Centauri in an 18 inch Newtonian, it will almost blind you. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that if you want to start having an observing program, try and judge the time of the year 
to see these objects at their best. Okay, I thought you might like, because some of you have been there, I've now just gone over to Luxor, our star party venue. And this is 11 o'clock tonight. Um, and these are the objects that you'll be able to see. And if you might recognize the, the actual site at Luxor. And these are the sort of view you're going to get tonight if you decided to go observing. And as you can see, Uranus Scorpius, Libra, um, the Earth Serpents, going up to Corona B and into Heracles itself. So how do I actually decide what I want to go and view? Well, there are now numerous decent um, observing guides. Steve O'Meara has produced some wonderful books on the subjects. These I particularly like. Obviously, the Messier objects is well known. Steve O'Meara has produced this book, which not only lists the 110 objects, or is it 109, but he also gives a write-up about what they actually are. So I will actually decide if I want to observe some of the Mezzi objects, on, like tonight, like M13 or M92. I can actually read up about it if I actually want to. He's also produced the same book on the Caldwell objects. This is the Caldwell objects, if you don't know, were named after Patrick Caldwell Moore. And Patrick did the same 110 objects, but he actually produced it for both the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere. From the UK, you can only see about 67. Um, so you really need to go further south if you want to see more of the Cold One objects. He's also produced Hidden Treasures, which has got about another 110, plus the Secret Deep, which has also got quite a few Southern um, Hemisphere stars, and also the very popular Herschel 400. And again, these are quite observable with a decent scope in the UK. And I'm, on, I'm currently on 396 of those particular objects. So I'm still hoping for the other four. But there are a few others that you might want to refer to. Um, some of you have referred to um, Turn Left at Orion, which is a very good book. But this particular one, Illustrate Guide for the Astronomical Wonders, is kind of an, um, an advanced copy of that. It covers about 400 objects and it lists them by constellation. So if you decided you wanted to follow and observe, say, Hercules tonight, you could go to that particular book. You could actually say, well, I want to look at all the objects in Hercules. And as Ian was saying, there are some very nice double stars. And within that book, they also list the best double stars as well. So you can, you can actually cover both double stars and deep sky objects, both galaxies and planets and nebulas, etc. Sue French did a very similar sort of book. Um, again, this is covered by date, so you only need to flick through to May or June or July, and it will show you all the objects, all the better objects that's viewed on those particular months. And again, they're listed not only on double stars, but also deep sky objects, but also some asterisms as well. Um, so that's another very good book to follow and I'll show you some of the things how I do it in a moment. And this is a more detailed book, The Night Sky, which you can get from First Light Objects. And this gives you a huge amount of information. It lists every single object, but it also tells you what it looks like in a four to six inch scope, an eight inch scope, 10 inch scope, 12, and then a, a 14 to 16, etc. So if you wanted to know what a particular object looked like through your 10 inch Newtonian or whatever else, this is a very good book to get. There's also a, a spring and summer version as well. So I have to take a drink, sorry. This is not red wine, this is cranberry juice. If you go yeah, to this, okay. yeah, okay. If you go to this particular website, they actually list 650 objects, deep sky objects, um, and they list them by constellation. They list them by um, their magnitude. So you can start at the beginning, for example, this is Virgo and it's showing you the brighter star and you can't see it very well, but it shows you the brighter galaxies in Virgo and then it goes on to another page. Um, and this is the back end of Ursa Major. So you can go through all this list and not only does it give you the NGC number, but it gives you what it 
type of thing it is, whether it's a galaxy or a planetary nebula or whatever else, um, obviously tells you the constellation. It gives you the right ascension and declination um, and gives you some basic information on it. So you can download that. And as this is being recorded, if you wanted a list other than your Messier list, or if you've gone through the Messier list and you wanted a more detailed list of objects, then obviously you could actually download this particular list. And as you can see, I didn't paint it out. Over this period of time, I actually have listed the, the dates when I actually viewed those, although I do produce a separate observing log. This is just to say that I've actually seen it at some stage. Now, if you really want to have um, an alternative list to the Messier list, this is produced by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and they say it's the finest uh, NGC list outside of the Messier list. Um, it does not include any of the Messier lists. So if you, if you want another list, and if you're into sketching, because a lot of people said, I actually would like to um, view for my scope, and I'd like to do some sketching. Well, obviously, if you go on to this uh, Canadian website, it lists all 110, and it actually gives you the details as you can actually see here. So if you wish, um, it tells you the best season to view it. I know it said spring here, but I mean, you can still see this uh, at the moment. You could draw your own uh, particular object. This is a wonderful galaxy to actually observe because it's quite close to another one. And in fact, the best time I ever saw this galaxy was at one of the star parties at Luxor a few years ago. So that is um, something that if you wanted to uh, follow another list and produce your own um, observing log with sketching, then that is a very good uh, website to follow. So how do I do it? Now, ignore that, that particular uh, short list. But if I'm going to do a planner, this is a large white uh, marker board. And I make a decision before I go out to say, I actually want to view these particular objects tonight. Um, I know I spread them out a bit here, so it's easier to see. So these are the five objects that we're going to have a look at later on. So I list the, the object. I briefly put the right ascension and declination on it. But I also put on there where I can find it in the Sky and Telescope Pocket Atlas. What I don't want to do is to start fumbling in the dark, trying to work out the star hop where these particular objects are. And I also do the same for the Interstellarium Star Atlas. So this is all done before I go down the garden, before I start observing. And I obviously do this earlier on. So that's actually put down at the end of the garden um, on my arbor, in fact, um, so I can easily access it. Okay, so I thought I'd put this in there as well because I occasionally see on um, SGL about seeing and transparency. And obviously for seeing, it's very important, especially as Ian was mentioning about double stars. You can get a good idea what the scene is like by actually viewing the stars and whether they're twinkling or not, or whether the planets are twinkling or not. So you can actually see if you've got absolutely incredible um, seeing where the stars are not twinkling and the planets aren't twinkling, great night for doing observing of the planets or the moon because it's not shaking around like a jelly. Um, so it gives you an idea what seeing means and how you can make your own assessment about uh, whether it's worth bothering or not to view a particular double star if it's very tight or not. One of the other important ones is transparency. Um, where I live at, at the edge of Hereford, I can very easily see all the stars in Ursa Minor. Um, so I can go outside and I can look up at Ursa Minor um, and get a good idea what transparent is going to be like. Uh, and as you can see, it tells you there, you can read yourself, if you can just see only just see Polaris and nothing else, it's not the best night to try and observe faint galaxies. Um, and as you can come along, you can start to see more and more stars. Most of the stars in, or the fainter stars in the um, Ursa Minor are about Mag 5. There are a few inside of it, which are about 5.5 or less. I can see these on a very good night from where I live. Um, 
I, I can't um, say I am your young eyes being over 70 I can't possibly say that but it gives you an idea if you want to have a quick go out and say oh I can see all the all the stars in Ursa Minor you know it's not a bad night for trying to seek out some of your fainter deep sky objects okay I actually thought because I don't know who was going to be on tonight um, but some people have actually say on this on the actual uh, forum what's it like through different telescopes because obviously here's a picture of Jupiter and I thought I would show you a picture of what a normal four inch refractor I mean some might say well actually I can see it better than that but it gives people who are starting out a rough idea what uh, a four inch refractor might look like looking at Jupiter I then said well actually uh, if you want to know what it's like using different magnifications this will give you some idea of what different magnifications would do for Jupiter and as although Jupiter is quite low in the sky at the moment as it's getting closer um, to us towards opposition as we get possibly towards the 21st of December this year I understand that you're going to get both Jupiter and you're going to get Saturn in the same field of view of your telescope which is the closest it's been since almost the telescope was invented 400 years ago so 21st of December is a great night for looking, um, or was it the early morning? I can't remember. It's a great time for looking at Jupiter and Saturn. Anyhow, if you want to see Saturn, I also thought this is roughly what you might see with a little four inch refractor. Um, and I know you, some people say, well, I can see it better than that. I can see the Cassini ring. But I mean, it's, uh, it gives you an idea. And then I thought, well, people ask about Uranus and Neptune. That's what, ne that's what Uranus might look like um, through your scope. But I'm normally a, a, a deep sky observer. And obviously one of the popular ones is in fact M31 with M32 and M110. And this is a great picture, but that's what you might see with your telescope. Um, I know you might see it better than that. I've seen further extensions of that from a really dark side, but it gives you a flavor of some of the things you might actually see um, of M31. Here is the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51, and this is what you might see. So uh, again, that gives you uh, a general idea of uh, what the two parts of uh, the Whirlpool might look like through a scope. I then thought I put you down uh, a globular cluster, and because I'm gonna talk about M5 later on, I thought I'd put M3 on there. Um, and that's what is a nice picture of it, but that's the sort of thing you might see with a four inch refractor. Again, this is very popular, the old Orion Nebula, the M42, and really it's M43 as well. But that's the sort of thing that you might see. And I know um, some of you might ask, what about increasing the, the, trans, the, the contrast by having a, a UHC or an oxygen three or a, a hydrogen beta? And I thought, no doubt over the next few weeks, we might have somebody who might want to talk about uh, filters in more detail. Okay, I thought I'd put these things on as well um, to give a general introduction of things. This is the star wheel that I usually take out to California, mainly because as I said it's, it's, its latitude is about 30 degrees. So it gives me a general idea what, what I can actually see um, down uh, if I went there or if I went into the Canary Islands or, or whatever else. And I always take that with me I always just take my sky and telescope uh, pocket atlas and I always take a pair of binoculars. Um, I don't take my large 15 by 70 Helios Apollos because they're quite heavy but I take a pair of Celestron 12 by 70s and I use those quite often when I go when I go abroad. Obviously these are the two, two before um, and this is what they look like. I thought I'd just put Lyra up on here. So if you're looking at the uh, sky and telescope pocket atlas, this will show you Lyra with Vega and, the, and in the middle there you'll see the rig nebula M57. Um, so if you're starting to find that and you want to start to star hop, um, you've got to decide where you're going to go from. But that's why I use a more detailed map. As you can see this is the interstellarium atlas and you can see I hope you can see that's M57 right smack in the middle so you could in fact in fact I never actually do star hopping whenever I went to see uh, the ring nebula 
I know exactly where it is. I just point the, the red dot finder between those two stars. Um, and usually M57 is smack in the field of view uh, when I start to observe it. So these are some of the uh, planetary software that's available. Uh, I've used Stellarium and I've used Sky Safari. I know a lot of people rate that one more than most. I've never used it, but I'm sure that there are ones amongst us here tonight that actually prefer that as planetary software. So I thought I'd set some challenges tonight. Um, and I haven't picked particularly difficult ones. They're all measuring objects. They're all visible at the moment if it gets dark enough. So this is where I'm now going to try and work out how to now switch to Stellarium. So I imagine I escape from here, don't I, Grant? Do I just stop and then restart, do I? Do I just... Is, is, that, is that in PowerPoint, uh, Mark? No, it's something else. So if I just come out... Yeah, if you stop yeah, come out. again, Mark. Yeah, that would be, that'd be the easiest thing. And come back in. And come back into there. Hooray. Right. i just do that. That's it. This is, again, I thought, because it's so close to our hearts, um, this is the, uh, the site at Lux Luxor again. And what I want to do is to try and show you how to do some star hopping, if I can find uh, where, oh, there it is over there. It's going round and round, isn't it? Where? Right. I think it might be easier if I do this. Okay, that's easier. I'm going to come into that. So if I want to find M51, we obviously all know Ursa Major, and we know the asterism of the plough. All I would do it was I actually put my red dot onto that particular star, and then I would use my phytoscope, which has got a five-degree field of view. Uh, virtually every single scope you buy with a phytoscope has a five-degree field of view. So if I now put my phytoscope on you will actually see that star 24. Oh, it's a satellite going across. You'll, you'll see that particular star in your field of view. If you now move your crosshairs onto that particular star, you will find in this corner, a triangle of stars. Quite noticeable, those that triangle of stars. If you look between the two of them, you will actually see this. If I come back out again, I'm going to go into it now. So you can now see there's that triangle of stars, and now you'll start to see M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. So if, you, if you've ever had problems um, finding M51, that's the easiest way of doing it. So you start at the end, use your finder scope to there, find the triangle, and there is the star there. So that's the first of the challenges if you want to go out and do it. What I now want to do is another object which is very, very difficult to see sometimes is Messier 101. I actually prefer to find Messier 101 because I'm now sat behind my black screen. I actually put down a, a very nice reclining chair and I will use my 15 by 70 binoculars and I will see 101 very clearly in those binoculars. But I accept that uh, you may want to see it in your scope. But anyhow, how you find it, we go back to Miser, the object that Ian was referring to. 
And if you count, because you'll start seeing these quite easy, one, two, three, four stars. And when you get to that four star, put on your finder scope. I don't mean that. Where did it go to? Sorry. Right. I'm now doing the finder scope. So on that end star, you'll see this line of stars here. And right in the middle, you'll see those two little stars there. If you look and draw a line, a theoretical line yourself to those stars, almost the same distance between those two stars, you will find this faint glow, which is Messier 101. It's a very easy way of finding it, I view. So it's back in again. As I say, it's one, two, three, four, the line of stars, and there is Messier 101. Okay. The next I'm going to do, because one of the other popular groups of stars, galaxies, sorry, that people want to see, are Messier 81 and Messier 82. So if you now go back to the bowl and draw a line, obviously, between that star and the pointer and that star there, draw a continuous line, imaginary line, you're, and you'll come to that star there. It's at almost the same distance. And if you look at those two stars, that star there and that star, it points to a little triangle, as you can see there. Uh, if you look at those two stars there and draw again an imaginary line, when you can look through binoculars or whatever else, you'll come to that star there. If I now put on, I'll put it onto that one there. If I put my phytoscope onto it, you'll now see 81, 82. And if you've never looked before, there's also another nice galaxy in the same field of view, which is, if my memory is right, NGC 3077. So you'll be able to see these particular three galaxies. Obviously, those are two of your Messier lists, and that is an additional galaxy that you may find on one of your observing lists. So that's uh, another group of, from the challenges tonight, and see if you can actually see that particular one. What I want to do is to come across now, back to here. You all, all know Hercules. This is the keystone. And if I actually went into there roughly, that would tell me that's where M13 is. So if I went to there, you can see there's M13. But I wasn't going to look at that. If you look at Corona B, beneath it, is a very nice constellation called Serpens. What I'm going to try and find tonight for you is M5, the easiest way of M5. So if you if you've actually visualize Corona B there and find that triangle, which is quite noticeable um, in the night sky if it's dark enough, <coughs> and come down, you'll come to this set of two stars there. If you go to the next star down, I just concentrate on that. If I go across, this is the last star in Virgo. So you'll be able to find that on a star atlas. Now, what I want to do is to find Messier 5. Now, what the best way of doing it, you're visualizing that star there, you're visualizing that star with your naked eye. Um, and with your red dot finder, I'll say, all right, I'm going to go halfway. I'll, I'll pick that star there. So halfway, find a scope, and there is M5. So that is the best way of finding that particular galaxy. I can tell you with a 12 inch telescope and something like a nine mil or a six mil uh, ethos eyepiece, um, the view of that particular globular cluster is almost as lovely as M13. So if you tend to go out and always look at M13 or have a look at M92, have a look at M5 because it is a beautiful globular cluster. The final challenge is because this is very low down, it is sometimes very difficult 
to actually see Messier 4. So if you go onto Antares, which is quite noticeable, nice and bright red, and put that into your phidoscope, you should be able to see another star there within your phidoscope. And this hazy patch here is in fact M4, the globular cluster. So, and if I go in, you'll start to see it being highlighted. So I just thought it would show you if you fancy just star hopping rather than using a go-to scope. I'd never use go-to. Um, I always prefer to, to decide the objects that I want to view based upon their right ascension. I may decide, for example, to say, oh, I think I'm going to have a look at all the deep sky objects in Serpen or the, all the deep sky objects in Boutez. I would write those up, putting down their right ascension and declination, putting down what uh, they are in the sky and telescope pocket atlas reference page and also the interstellarium page and literally then start looking for them. And I, also, I always do it by star hopping. I'll pick a particular star like that and then I would go star hopping to find that particular object. It becomes where it's re relatively easy to find busy objects and the brighter galaxies is where you start going into fainter galaxies in the Herschel 400 or that 650 list I showed you. And sometimes it's beyond um, the, the interstellarium atlas. I can't see precisely where it, where it is. And that was the case recently um, of one of the supernovas that we had um, in Leo or just below Leo. Um, and in the end, what I actually did was to zoom into it on Stellarium. And I then actually copied out the particular field of view. And if you've never seen this, if I go back to that particular object there again. You can, if you, if you want to, you can make a decision about different things. So if I went in there and started changing it, I can actually decide different, for example, that's a 10 mil eyepiece. That's a six mil ethos. And I can actually then get an idea. That's my field of view. I might um, do a, a snippet tool. I would then convert this to a black and white print in Photoshop and I then take it out with me and, and I can then start seeing the star patterns that are available um, in and around, not so much this one here because it's easy, but some of the fainter galaxies, I can start seeing some of the um, fainter stars around and work out precisely where um, that galaxy might be. So there we are. So I think roughly that's my little chat about observing my program, the books, the scope, modifications, etc. Shall I stop sharing now? Uh, you can do, mate. Yeah, if that's uh, well, actually, before, so before you go, uh, do stop that, Mark. Is that so? Presumably, the eyepieces uh, in Stellarium, um, you need to set those up. You need to set them uh, from, up from the, from the outset, don't you? You do. What, I, what I've actually got on the, this is the latest version of Stellarium, um, version 20. Um, I, I actually put in there uh, the three main scopes that I've got. I got obviously the 12 inch dot that you see in the picture of. I've also got a six inch Newtonian and I've got that lovely little uh, uh, Skywatcher Heritage 130p, which I use for grab and go. Mm -hmm. And I then list, you sort all the eyepieces. Um, on that case that I had. And I actually put all those eyepieces and all my telescopes and my binoculars into Stellarium. So okay. I could actually go into there and actually make uh, a particular view of what it, was, what it looked like on uh, uh, a particular object. Obviously, sometimes if it's a faint galaxy, I won't necessarily go onto a six mil ethos. I might start on my 24, explore scientific or I might go into my 20 mil 100 degree eyepiece to get a much wider field of view. 
yeah. I actually plan what I might go and have a look at to a particular eyepiece. Yes. So, uh, okay, so you, you spend, I don't know, a couple of hours or so inter entering your scope details and your, your eyepiece field of view, magnification size, all that sort yeah. of stuff, uh, focal length, and, uh, uh, and then it generates those, those views yeah. for you. But they're there. Yeah. Once, you, once you've set it up. Uh, indeed, they're there, uh, aren't they? They're there. And, and, and interesting, obviously, it's not that long ago that I upgraded to Stellarium 20.1. I think it was 18 point something. Yeah. It automatically actually uh, um, updates that as well. They, 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 you don't lose them. You don't have to put them all back in again. They're there. Okay. Okay. Understood. Understood. Um, uh, okay. So on to the questions. Uh, Chris Lee again. So Chris, I will uh, click the magic button and hopefully. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Really enjoyed that. Uh, can I ask about how you record your observations? You showed one of the tables you take from the date sky um, uh, table where you annotated against it but do you use a package to record all your observations in a log um, that you then can search online or is it just um uh, you I don't, don't like activity? yeah yeah no i don't use uh, anything online at all well I, in saying that um, when i'm actually doing observing um if there's something that that a particularly notices or if there's something i want to record i, I sometimes either write it on to um, the whiteboard because that's much easier um, uh, more often than not i have another whiteboard as well so i can actually record more detail if i need to i then bring that in um, and usually the next day um, i update it uh, exactly what it is um, and quite often if it's a good session i will actually then type it up and i usually put that on to stargazer lounge as an observing report so i know the date that i have actually done these observing um, and i can actually refer back if i need to but i don't uh, i don't sketch i've never done that makes i can't do it very well um, but i do record it both in a log um, and also on a, on, a, on a separate piece of paper if i need to or onto the computer thanks uh, good stuff. I have to say, Mark, the the, the tips on um, on the on the star hopping. Obviously, uh, we all know sort of what, what star hopping is, but I've never really got to grips with it. And finding M one uh, M eighty one and M eighty two is it's always a it's like a I don't know. It's like my nemesis for some reason. I really really struggle. But you've made that so so easy. I, I'm now looking outside, and of course it's cloudy, so I've got uh, no hope of uh, giving that a giving that a go tonight. Uh, lots of people coming in saying thanks very much. Lots of helpful tips. Uh, Ron, I don't know what scope you're buying now, but uh, uh, what, what are you up to? Uh, <laughs> uh, Ron's scope's not coming till um, uh, till August, so um, uh, uh, permanently cloudy here. Yes, you're right, Merlin, it is. Um, any other questions from uh, anybody? I'll be happy to unmute you or I'll ask on your behalf. It's free 100. You'll love it. I have one for um, uh, for imaging. I uh, when I do some imaging, I've got one of those. You, you'll absolutely love that. Uh, love they're, that. They're beautiful for observing as well. The Esprits. Oh, that's what that funny glass thing was that came in the uh, in the box. Uh, that's an eyepiece, mm -hmm. is it? Right. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll have to Mark, what that. finder do you tend to use? Do you use an optical finder? Oh, sorry, um, Grant. Um, I use um, on that picture. You'll see I have a red dot finder uh, on the stalk, um, and I'm normally, if I'm going to star hop, I will actually use the red dot finder to pick up the particular star that I want to star hop from. I then go to the large 80 mil finder scope, which is correct image, right angled finder. Um, a and I, 80 mil finder scope. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, if you're looking for, I mean, these most of the objects I've showed tonight are quite easy to see and, and, and find. If you're starting to look for some quite faint uh, galaxies, um, and if you're starting to use, as I was showing you, that uh, close up version um, using Stellarium, which I might have copied and then transferred onto a black and white print. I need as much information on those stars as possible. So an 80 mil finderscope will give me um, obviously fainter stars I can see. So on the 12 inch scope, I use the 80 mil. On my six inch Newtonian, I use a 60 mil. Again, right angle finder, correct image. And actually on my um, Heritage 130P, which hasn't got the provision for that, I've actually put a little bracket on there 
and I use a 9 by 50 right angled finder scope. So I got three different finder scopes and I use the different ones for the different scopes. Great, great. Um, the 18 um, finder scope isn't going to work on a heritage, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed, no, indeed. Um, Merlin one hundred uh, has a question. I've just got to find. But oh, there we are. There we are. I think that's uh, right. So, uh, uh, also known as Ian. So, Ian, I will um, click that button, and it should ask to unmute you. Hi, Ian. You there? Oh, isn't no, yeah, no video or yeah, audio? Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, no video or audio. Okay, that's a shame. So, um, Berlin has asked then, um, Mark, is there a limit to DSO observing in an urban light polluted area using an eight inch dob? Well, as I said, the easiest way of actually working out how bad your night sky is um, is looking at Ursa Minor. Um, and that'll give you an idea by looking at those stars and what the magnitude of those stars are, um, what um, you're looking at. Um, clearly, when you start uh, um, trying to find some of the fainter deep sky objects, light pollution is going to make a mess of that. You're not going to see it quite so well. Um, and I think it's been said that um, should I upgrade to a uh, 12 inch or 14 inch or 16 inch and somebody will come on the forum and say well actually uh, take your 6 inch or 8 inch scope to a dark site and you'll see more than a 16 inch in an urban light polluted area. Um, so it's, it's difficult to, uh, I, I suppose I'm very lucky because uh, for those of you that have been to Luxor, my garden is almost the same sort of darkness as the Luxor site to give you an idea. And if I look towards um, the north, I start to look towards Hereford and there will be some light pollution from Hereford. Yeah. And it starts to get difficult when the Cassiopeia or um, Ursa Minor starts to come round. Um, if I try to find um, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major M8182, when Ursa Major is close to the horizon, I will struggle to see that those two objects because of the the, the glow from Hereford. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, it's difficult to uh, certainly. Uh, uh, I can remember. I'm not sure if John's on the uh, on the fall, on, on the thing tonight, but I remember going out with John to Luxor, the two of us together. And Luxor, and I think between us, we must, he had his six inch um, uh, um, scope and I had my six inch scope. And between us, we found about 40 galaxies in one night going from star hopping. That's just being greedy. I know. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, I know it's said so many times, if you want to start seeing some of these objects, you've got to go to a dark site. That is not easy if you live in a large conurbation, that's no, um, very true, uh, and especially under well, obviously what we're what we're experiencing at the moment, at the moment. is uh, somewhat of a challenge. And also that I mean, I, I from from Hereford, I can drive out quite easily um, to some very dark sites if I wanted to, but I then think, do I really want to take a scope out to the middle of nowhere by myself? Because um, you're always worried about. Uh, who might be around because yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. you're using expensive kit so that's why it's quite nice that uh, uh, that we have star parties or if you belong to a local astronomical society you can go out to their dark site for example in, in Hereford uh, because a lot of you know the area if you go from the Luxor caravan site towards Fownhope not that you can go there at the moment because the road's still collapsed but if you go towards Fownhope go all the way through it comes back around by the church to a very dark field, uh, which is the, the village hall field. And yeah. that is absolutely pitch black. Um, and our local Astro Society goes there and usually about 10 to 15 people always turn up. And they're totally amazed by some of the objects that you can actually see with the naked eye. Yeah, yeah, 
Very I good. don't think I don't think I've answered the question really. Uh, no, no, I think uh, I think that's fine. Uh, and some people are saying, um, uh, and I must admit, I didn't either. A great tip on using uh, Steve Clifford has come back with this great tip on using Ursa Minor uh, to estimate the sky transparency. He's going to check on that um, when, or indeed, if the storms um, the storms moved on. Um, Excellent. Uh, so, everybody, thank you very much. I, I haven't seen any more questions come in. So, in that case, then, I'll, we'll say uh, very many thanks to, uh, to both Ian and Mark. Uh, I've certainly learned a few things, um, some tips and tricks from, from both. Uh, clearly, there on the forums, feel free to ask questions. Um, guys, we're going to see if we can steal your presentations from you and, um, uh, and get those posted up. Uh, and indeed, some of the uh, some of the links as well. Um, obviously, uh, do check out First Light Optics. I know some of the books that um, other guys have referred to are are listed in there. Uh, so please, of course, do uh, do check out First Light. Uh, so hopefully, uh, we'll have some more of these shorter sessions. I say shorter sessions. We've gone for a good uh, hour and a half now. Um, uh, uh, during during the coming weeks, uh, can't guarantee it's going to be uh, every week. Uh, and again, if anybody fancies giving a short talk on a on a topic that they uh, think they know a little bit about, that would be that would be awesome. Uh, we'd love to we'd love to host you. Uh, but for now, I think that's probably uh, probably it. Uh, Grant, could you just remind us um, on Sunday's talk? Yeah, uh, so Sunday is <laughs> <laughs> pressing the wrong button. Uh, Peter <laughs> Williamson is going to be doing his Herschel to Hawkwind talk at half past seven on Sunday. Um, I'll stick the banner up later today or early tomorrow for that. Um, so that's that's the next one. We haven't got anybody booked yet after that, um, but there's various feelers out there. But if anybody's got any suggestions, we're always open. Uh, indeed. In that case, guys, uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Hope it's not uh, too wet and soggy for you. And we'll see you all on Sunday. Many thanks, Ian and Mark. See you all soon. Thanks, Thank Ian. you. Thanks, Mark. thanks all. Cheerio. Cheers.